I'll yield yeah. as much time as you may uh, take uh, for your line of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senators, um, for, for being here. First, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to include the following in the record. <laughs> Letters to the both of us from the American Federation of Government Employees, the Bipartisan Policy Center, and the National uh, Postal Mail Handlers Union, a letter to all representatives and senators from the AARP, and finally, a letter uh, to all members of Congress from the President and CEO of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. These are all based in West Texas. No. <laughs> I, Without objection, so ordered. Good, uh, good organizations. But uh, well, thank you again, and uh, very much admire uh, both of your careers in public service. Um, I, just a couple points, and then I wanted to give you both the opportunity to uh, address something that my predecessor who served on one of these commissions that didn't succeed, said when we had a hearing here uh, a couple weeks ago on exactly the same topic. First, I always point out to people, um, because you know sometimes um, uh, through nostalgia, the sort of fairy tales get told about a perfect past that, that was never so, sadly. Um, everyone points to the great example in 1983 where President Reagan and Tip O'Neill shook hands and they saved Social Security. That part is true. The part that is often left out is that we were literally just weeks away from Social Security payments being missed. That's how close to the deadline they were. So I point out to people, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is we have time. Social Security Trust Fund will uh, become insolvent either 2033 or 2034, depending on if you use the CBO figures or the Social Security Trustee figures. So we have about a decade. Medicare trust funds become insolvent a little bit before that. So the good news is we have time. The bad news is we have time. And given the way human nature is, given the way Congress um, tends to act just basically based on deadlines, uh, time in this regard is, is not our friend. I would also point out that, uh, and I, you gentlemen weren't here for this, but in previous hearings and in the previous panel, where we have three different bipartisan sets of representatives with their own commission ideas, which actually are very similar to what you have come up with. Ultimately, regardless of the shape and form of a commission, or if Congress just finally did its job in terms of the legislative process, it ultimately will come down to a decision of either more revenues or cuts or a blend of the two. I have been quite clear, I come down on the side of more revenues. I have a piece of legislation, I've put, um, I put it right there in writing, what my plan would be to ensure Social Security is there through the year 2100. Sheldon Whitehouse has the companion piece of legislation uh, in the Senate. And I think it's important to keep in mind where the American people are on this issue. According to uh, Navigator polling from this June, when asked about approaches to reducing the deficit, 82% of Americans opted for raising taxes on the top 1% in corporations, including closing tax loopholes, and only 7% opted for uh, cuts to Social Security and Medicare. So the American people are pretty clearly, overwhelmingly, on the more revenue side of this equation as opposed to, as opposed to cuts. Um, now, finally, I just want to give you the opportunity to, to respond to something. Um, my predecessor, the chairman of this committee, John Yarmuth, who served on one of these commissions that unfortunately did, did not succeed, which has been the history of the commissions, the various ones that have existed over the last uh, decade or two. And he said something in, in his opening statement that I'm just going to read, and I wanted to invite um, uh, the both of you to comment or point out where you, you think uh, he may be wrong. He said, quote, while some of the other members of this committee might take issue with my evaluation, I believe the process illuminated one fairly obvious but unavoidable truth. The problem is not the process, it's the people. In other words, if members of Congress are not willing to muster the determination and courage to take on our fiscal challenges, even the best ideas will never be implemented. So I'd open up uh, to the both of you to uh, either agree or disagree or um, in any way uh, react to what Chairman Yarmouth said. Uh, so I'll yield 
Senator Romney, Senator Manchin. Let Senator me just say on, on that, you know, I, I look back in history and try to figure out, Ross Perot ran as an independent, okay? And he ran on one item, was the finances of our country, and made that his focal point of running. We were maybe two, three trillion dollars of debt at that period of time, if that. But that was, he knew we were going in the wrong direction and no one was stopping it. So that caused some concern. We should have been alarmed and we weren't. How many of us know people that we talk to that says, I don't mind paying taxes, I just don't like how you spend it? We hear that from everybody, people of high net values and all. How do we do it in 1997? How did they do it with Clinton and basically uh, Newt Gingrich putting Erskine Balls, the most responsible, reasonable person, I think one of the top ones I've ever met, and then having John Kasich, one of the most sincere people I've ever met on that side too, come together and form basically a rate, a tax rate, it basically did not cripple or hamper our economy whatsoever. We grew under that. We were on a trajectory that we would have been basically debt-free by 2006. Debt-free. We had 9-11 happen. We declared two wars, never paid for them. We had two tax cuts we never took in consideration. And then when those tax cuts, I was there when basically they went off. Out of 10 years, all, all President Obama had to do was be silent, say nothing. And we'd have been right back where we were same thing of 97, but they had to inject. Anybody that makes less than $250,000 will not be affected in any way, shape, or form. Then, we, further down the road, just recently, as uh, President Biden says, anybody that makes less than $400,000 will not be affected. We're all in this, we're all Americans, we're all in this. So if it worked in 97 up to 2001, we had balanced budgets, we had surpluses. Look at the last success we've had and see how that would cripple us today or not. And if it wouldn't, we have to start looking at how do we save the trust funds. I've got to answer to Medicaid and Medicare, people who depend on my state. The trust funds are going to be basically insolvent. And we've talked about this. Take the cap off, the FICA cap. Okay, well, if you said you spend it strictly to save the trust fund and not being going into the treasury could be spent for discretionary or non whatever, people may be more acceptable. You have to look at everything. And we don't have to cut and basically scare the bejesus out of people that we have in our home states right now. So somehow we've got to calm it down, but we've got to come to realization. Someone's going to pay the piper here. And what the, the last one of the um, graphs that, that Mitt had here showed that where our interest is going, when interest basically surpasses every spending item that we have, that's as critical as it gets. Senator Romney, did you want to? Yeah, just, just a couple of comments. One, I, that poll is amazing. I can't believe there are 8% of the people who think we ought to cut Social Security. <laughs> it was seven. There was seven. Was it seven? Uh, I, I, it's astonishing. I'd like to see who they are because I don't know a single Republican uh, or a single Democrat who thinks we ought to cut Social Security, uh, uh, reduce the funding for Social Security. They may exist out there. I just haven't met them. So there is, there is zero interest on the part of either side of the aisle to cut Social Security or cut Social Security benefits. Uh, both the leading contenders for 2024, former President Trump, current President Biden, have both said, we're not gonna touch Social Security. And uh, Joe and I fully agree, and my guess is every member of this commission would fully agree. The question is, well, uh, how about for people in their 20s and 30s? What should it look like at that point? How long will they live? Uh, what, should the, uh, what should the tax be? I mean, uh, uh, what part of income should it be? Should, it be, uh, should we lift the cap, as, as uh, Senator Mash has indicated? So all those things are on the table for discussion. One thing that's not on the table uh, is the idea that we're gonna cut benefits. That's just, that would simply be unacceptable. It's not, not, uh, not realistic. Um, I do agree that, that, uh, that we have to look for the pe to the people, the people that have been elected to solve these problems. I, your, your quote about that is absolutely right. And what we found is that over time, we've come closest to dealing the, uh, with this challenge, our, our taxing, spending, fiscal challenge, when there's been a bipartisan effort. And uh, Joe and I just worked together in a bipartisan effort on an infrastructure bill, where equal number of Republicans and Democrats worked together across the divide, if you will, and got something done. So a bipartisan effort is what I think the Hyzenga bill proposes, what we're proposing, they're very similar pieces of legislation, is saying, hey, let's create a bipartisan effort of elected officials to work together to see if they can come up with something that passes muster in, on both sides of the aisle, and if it does, let's vote on it, up or down. Because I, and I, I do think that the urgency today 
I mean, I, I didn't underscore this urgency, but I, I spent my life in the private sector and the financial sector. Uh, it's going to get hard to sell U.S. debt. And we might want to lower interest rates, you know, say, okay, well, we're over the tough times, let's bring the, inflation has been dealt with, let's bring infl interest rates down. The Fed's not going to be able to control interest rates if people don't want to buy our treasuries. Their interest rates are going to start going up all by themselves. And you can have a spiral where interest rates go higher, our deficit gets larger, we need more, issue more treasuries, we have to raise interest rates higher. We can find ourselves in a Latin America type circumstance. So we, sometime during the next few years, we can have failed treasury auctions, interest rates going up. I mean, th this, is, this is the reality. So it's not, I recognize, we, Social Security trust fund runs out, Medicare trust fund runs out down the road. We have time on those. But the urgency of a potentially failed treasury auction, rapidly rising interest rates, and not being able to keep mi up militarily, that's with us right now. I, I mean, I would just, um, while, no one should misunderstand me, and, and Chairman knows this because we've had a, a ton of hearings. I have never suggested that the deficit or debt is, is nothing to worry about. Uh, clearly, and actually my, my colleague who was on one of the previous panels, uh, Mr. Peters from California, points this out that interest taking an increased percentage of our budget should concern both Democrats and Republicans alike, probably for different reasons, but that is something uh, on, on which we should all agree. I will say, though, to your point, Senator Romney, uh, I just looked this morning, the 10-year, uh, yield, the yield on the 10-year is down to 4.3. It was above uh, 5 about a month ago, which was a peak, you know, I, it hadn't been at that level in, in over a decade. The demand right now in the world for U.S. Treasuries is still um, as high as it can possibly be. So I don't think that we're anywhere close to the sort of nightmare Latin American-like um, scenario that you described, but I'm no means Conference by no means suggesting that we don't have that we have nothing to worry about and that it'll always be that way. If I can say just yeah. one thing on that. Uh, there, basically, if you look at how much we've increased as far as the Treasury, how much of a quantitative easing we bought ourselves, yeah. we've never been in this category. They went quite close to 10, 10 trillion. They're about 8.3, 8.4 now, and we were at three or four trillion back in 2018, 2019. There's no reason in the world that we should be buying this much paper of ourselves. We raise cane about other countries manipulating their dollar, their, their currency. We've been the worst in the world in manipulating our currency, buying our own paper and have false pretenses of what we have and how strong our demand is. The demand's pretty damn strong if you're competing with us. We're competing with ourselves. That didn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, and uh, I, I've said this, that if we don't stop, and I think they've been bringing it down to a certain extent, but not fast enough, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you no, off I'm for fine. you. I'm fine. I, rather than, than uh, I, I can dispense with my further questions and yield my time to.